certainly seems like there is a point when you have finally learned to keep your kite in the air and you can go back and forth and you can land it and you can describe square corners in the sky and there's a bit of a wall there and on the other side of that wall is a whole bunch of neat stuff that a lot yeah. of people never uh, never get to see especially if they're in areas where there aren't experienced flyers doing cool stuff uh, that's it's a whole nother world and it'll keep you out flying for years beyond the point where you learn to keep the kite in the sky I think there's a difference between teaching somebody by telling, by describing something and teaching somebody by giving them a series of tools to learn it with. Any, any complicated move is a series of less complicated moves and if you can learn what those are and isolate those out it becomes a lot easier to, to put it together. The next step that you're going to take is dependent on being able to do the previous well. I will go to the field and work on one thing, or maybe two things or three things, for four or five hours. And um, it's a lot of fun when you're just working on a couple things. You see a lot of improvement. But that, you know, I don't see it as practicing, really, because it's all, it's all a lot of fun just to see it kind of unfold. But that's what I do. You learn the snap stall, you have that down, you're really good at it. Well, that opens up a whole other door to many, many different tricks. Mm -hmm. You can't learn all of those tricks today. You may be able to learn one of those tricks today. It helps me a lot to, uh, to think about flying a maneuver in terms of like just one particular aspect. If I'm going to do a backflip into a lazy susan into a recovery, I might just decide that the only thing I'm going to think about is that recovery. The moves that are harder to learn are the ones where they where everything needs to be there all at once. And so the challenge is actually breaking it down and figuring out how to take the move apart and learn its various components and really figure out what what the parts of the move are. What's the attitude of the kite? What's the slack on the line? Yeah. What's the position in the window? What's the, uh, what's the feel in my wrists and the feel of my feet yeah. and the exactly. feel of my back? Exactly. And try to work on those things one thing at a time. Video is a great medium for, for learning because you can watch it and replay it. The same yeah. thing, that's great. Anything you learn is going to leave your kite on the ground at some point. <laughs> how much are you going to want to walk? And so you want to spend your time flying, you better learn how to get it back off the ground. Or you're going to spend your time walking and not flying. The basic one, which is called the cartwheel, the cartwheel is pretty darn easy to learn. And you can practice it and have it down pretty cold. Oh, man. Real rewarding. I've seen so much joy, so much expression and smiles when people just learn that because they've been spending their time <laughs> walking back and forth. And all of a sudden, their world just totally changed. While you're practicing, the kite lands on its leading edge constantly. A simple, mellow hand motion flips the kite to launch position. Let's take a closer look at the kite during a cartwheel. Start from any leading edge crash or landing. Then tip the wing in the air back. Pull on the top wing while releasing the bottom wing to roll the kite over. And then straighten or square the kite up for relaunch. Let's take a detailed look at the cartwheel. Land your kite on its leading edge about halfway out to the edge of the wind window. Then position the kite so that the nose points in towards the center of the wind window. To get the kite in this position, you'll need to learn to seesaw the kite from leading edge to leading edge. Practice gently pulling one wing and then the other so you can always rock the kite from one leading edge to the other. With the kite in correct position, let the wing tip that's pointed up drop back away from you. When the kite is in this position and you've taken up slack in both lines, your hands should be apart like this. Now gently exchange your hands while taking two to three steps back 
and the kite should flip over its wingtip to a launch ready position. If the kite isn't quite square to you, straighten things up with a gentle tug before you launch. You don't need to yank on the lines to get the kite to roll over. If anything, you should make a point of starting out too gently. You can see that the kite doesn't quite flip over. Then move your hands a little more briskly until the kite just rolls over. The trick is not to yank on the kite. Even though it looks like people do that, you don't need a lot of motion to no. pull on your strings and no. get the kite to flip over. If you can get the wind to do the work, you break a lot fewer sticks. Don't forget to move back as you do the cartwheel. Those few steps are critical to getting a clean roll. The leading edge launch is especially useful if the kite lands near the edge of the wind window. The leading edge launch starts with the kite in a similar position to the cartwheel, but simply sweeps the kite up off the ground in one smooth motion. Leading edge launches, yeah. the, the kite basically launches itself. You get it in the right position and say, go now. To learn this launch, set up the kite on its leading edge near the edge of the window with the nose pointing out to the edge. Then ease the top wing towards you until the kite just begins to fall. Now add a little tension to the bottom line and begin to move your body backwards, causing the kite to skid on its leading edge towards the edge of the window. As the nose of the kite comes up, sweep your hands back for additional power and steer the kite off the ground. If you're having trouble, remember that the leading edge launch can only be done towards the edge of the window. In lighter winds, you'll be able to start this launch closer to the center. In heavier winds, you'll need to start pretty close to the edge in order to allow the wing to fall towards you. The belly launch, or pop-up launch, is a dramatic way to get your kite back up in lighter winds. If your kite will fall towards you onto its belly with the nose pointing away from you, then conditions are light enough for the belly launch. Set up with the kite directly downwind on its belly, nose away. Pick a wing and tug it gently towards you a few inches so that the kite is slightly off square. On the eclipse and total eclipse, pull the kite until you can sight straight down the seam at the edge of the center panel. To get the kite to pop off the ground, you'll use a short, sharp wrist motion on the line opposite the one you use to adjust the angle of the kite. This is what the hand motion should look like. Be sure to give slack instantly after the tug so that the kite is free to rise off the ground. The kite will pop off the ground and rotate, in this case to the right. When it won't rise any higher or rotate any further, pull your hands back for power and steer the kite into the sky. If your kite just flies right back into the ground after the initial tug, check these three things. Most people start with a pull that's too long and not sharp enough. The pull should just give the line a quick hit. You'll be surprised at how light it can be. Just after the hit, you've got to give the kite enough slack to rise up on its own. If the lines fetch up early, the kite noses back into the ground. Check the angle that you start out with. With the Eclipse family, it should be easy to nail the angle every time. With other kites, you'll have to experiment with different angles and different amounts of pull. The flip launch is easy and it's great for the lightest winds. Start with the kite belly down and nose away. Tug on one wing until you can sight straight down the leading edge. A short, sharp tug on the opposite wing will flip the kite over to launch position. Square up the kite and you're ready to launch. You can well, do as uh, many tricks and you can right. try as many different things as you want because it doesn't matter how your kite gets <laughs> on the ground, you can get it off. As you practice relaunches and other advanced maneuvers, you may sometimes get your line tangled around the kite. The most common tangle you'll encounter is a wrap around the wingtip. To get out of a tip wrap when the kite is on its back, pull the tangled wingtip towards you and gently jiggle it until the line is free. 
If you have trouble, try untangling a few tip wraps much closer to the kite so you can see exactly what needs to happen to free the line. With patience and a little practice, you'll be able to undo most tangles without walking to the kite. In competition situations where a single tangle means lost points, you can eliminate the knot altogether by cutting off the shock cord loops and lashing the tips with thin cord. I think it's a pretty big revelation when you spend a lot of time learning how to fly your kite and keep it flying. <laughs> to learn that stopping your kite is just as much fun and stopping the thing from flying. It's the next step. And it's the opening to everything else you can do with kites just about. The stall's been around for a long time and so we think that, oh, that's, that's old stuff. I'll go beyond. I'll learn the new stuff. None of that new stuff's available to you until you have the stall down perfect. Anytime your kite isn't actively flying forward, it's in a stalled or partially stalled state where the airflow over the wing is disrupted and not providing lift. The first step in learning stalls is to get comfortable controlling the kite in this stalled state. The very lightest winds are perfect for your first stall practice because in these conditions the kite can barely fly, so it will be in a stalled or partially stalled state for most of your practice session. Start with the kite directly downwind and ready to launch. Smoothly sweep your arms back just enough to launch the kite to about one wingspan off the ground, concentrating on keeping it perfectly horizontal. Try to touch down with both tips at the same time. When you can get five good touchdowns in a row, pull the kite twice as high and try again. Controlling the kite will be easier if you tuck your wrists inwards somewhat. You can also rest your fingertips against the protected part of your control lines. This hand position will let you include subtle wrist motions in your corrections. If a wingtip starts to drop, just a tiny tug on that wing can help lift it back up to a horizontal position. Moving your body will also be critical in controlling the stalled kite. Move your body back slowly if your kite drops too much or if your lines even begin to go slack. You can't afford to lose contact with the kite for even a moment. Moving your body forwards or downwind helps settle the kite towards the ground and can be part of correcting an imbalance. Most important is to concentrate full force on the kite to catch imbalances early and correct them with the smallest control motions possible. If you're too late in making a correction, you'll almost certainly overcorrect, making recovery much more difficult. Work on adding altitude until you can float the kite down most of the window and still land on both tips. Now it's time to work on floating the kite sideways. Start with a low launch at the center of the window. This time, try to float the kite to the right and still land on both tips. Look for a float position where one wing is slightly low. The kite is more likely to slide sideways in a stall in the direction of this lower wing. Work the sideways float or helicopter higher and longer until you have good control in both directions. A simple downwards turn at the edge of the window with a well-timed release can create an impressive sliding stall or float. Learning how to create and maintain this sliding stall is a perfect second step in learning stall technique. At the edge of the window, start a downwards turn with a pull on the lower wing. As the kite turns and approaches horizontal, a well-timed release will set up a perfect sliding stall. Try to work this slide as far across the window as you can. To get a nice long float or helicopter, you'll want to exit the downward turn fully stalled and balanced with the leading wingtip slightly lower. Try to keep the hand that controls the leading wing frozen as you make small adjustments with the trailing hand. Move your body to determine whether the stalled kite sinks or rises. If you get to the end of your float and the kite won't slide any further, try giving a tug to reverse direction and floating back the other way. 
On a perfect light wind day, it's possible to set up a sideways float and bring the kite 360 degrees all the way around you. that I was different than anything I'd ever saw somebody doing with a kite, and I really admired it, and I thought the guy was a genius. <laughs> Flying really fast, whap, big sound, snap, just stood there for a, just a blink of the eye, and then boom, it was gone again. Very cool. And all of a sudden, that dead ability that it's like you can be racking that thing across the sky and stop it on a dime. Yeah. The snap stall is induced with a rapid, rhythmic movement using both hands. Start with a basic ground pass. The first hand makes a small tug on the upper wing right here. Then almost instantly after that tug, a much sharper tug on the lower wing here shakes the air off the sail and swings the kite into a perfect horizontal stall. Like so many advanced moves, the snap stall can't be achieved with just arm motion. You'll need to have the speed advantage of using wrist motion. So in preparation for a snap stall, cock both wrists inwards like this. Here's the snap stall motion broken down. The wrists cock inwards in preparation for the stall. The first wing gets its small tug here. You can see the other hand is already in motion to follow instantly with the bigger tug on the lower wing, right here. Both hands give slack immediately after the tugs to maintain the stall. Close your eyes for a moment and listen to two snap stalls. The rhythm of the two tugs should be as close together as possible. Here's the rhythm of a good snap stall. Now listen to the rhythm of a great snap stall. Try to keep this rhythm in mind as you practice your snap stalls. Let's look at the whole sequence in slow motion without any interruption. And now once at full speed, just to give you an idea of how fast the whole thing has to be put together. If your snap stalls aren't rotating enough so that the kite just wobbles and keeps on flying, then your motions aren't quick and snappy enough, and your release after the two tugs may also not be aggressive enough. If your snap stall rotates too much, then your motions are probably too large or not close enough together. Remember the rhythm. If you get good rotation but the kite just flies away and doesn't stick, then you need to concentrate on giving the kite enough slack to stay stalled. Quicker release and moving your body forward should help. If you view the tip stab as being the most dramatic stall you can probably make, that it's just a stall. It's just the matter of where you're actually turning that wingtip above the ground. Even in stronger winds, the, uh, the edge of the wind window is a pretty good place to be tip stabbing. It just takes the load off the kite, things happen a little more slowly, and uh, your chances are better. Start practicing tip stabs by flying a ground pass across the window. As the kite begins to slow down, work on timing a snap stall that rotates the kite only slightly so that the lower wing points at the ground. Then float that tip down until it lands in a tip stand. Slowly time the stall closer and closer to the ground until the tip stabs in rather than floating down. One thing I found that really helps with the timing of tip stabs is to watch not the kite but to watch the ground. To locate a place on the ground that your eyes focus on and just watch the kite out of, out of the periphery of your vision. And something about that wires the timing so that you get the kite down into the ground. Yeah. It really helps me out. A cleanly executed tip stab should be a dramatic stab into the ground. As you gain confidence, practice your stabs in more wind and closer to the center of the window. 
and once you have the basic stab mastered, be sure to try stabs from both vertical and diagonal dives. The tip stab can be an expensive very, to learn. Very so, expensive. So if you want to put the tip stab in your tool bag, you need to have a master card available? I suggest you have a lot of, I would say maybe three or four leading edge rods. When we started doing axles and we started really figuring out what that maneuver was, there were only a couple people doing it, and it uh, took a long time to figure out how to teach that maneuver. But the key seemed to be to give the kite plenty of slack. Basically, as your kite rotates in an axle, it needs to float downwind as well. If you try to use the kite's momentum to overcome the wind, you often won't get it to come all the way around. The place where you really get to show off your control is with slow axles. Oh, yeah. I and mean, that's it's the most elegant. That's the thing that separates the flyers on the field. When you go out there <laughs> and one guy can dial his kite around in yeah. slow motion, yeah. super flat, lots right. of slack, right. and just land it back down on the ground, and just use maybe two inches of wrist motion. You know, that's, that's when you really start to have the control under your belt. Well, I think the flat axle, and what you were just talking about, and having a nice and flat, plenty of line, is a very it's probably the most elegant looking axle. But I think a harder axle, which requires you pull on it more, it's more aggressive, has its place also. And it's just a faster, quicker move. And it's something that we all do when we first start doing them. But it's just a grosser, more aggressive move. But it certainly has its place. It can be a lot of fun to do. The basic axle starts from a fully stalled position. Once the stall is established, one wing gets a sharp tug while the other wing is immediately given slack to allow the whole kite to rotate in a stalled state. Here's the tug. Halfway through the axle, the kite is nose away and flat. With both lines still slack, the kite's own momentum is enough to complete the rotation. First the kite has to be stalled. Then you'll look for the perfect starting position. Then give the tug that initiates the axle, and finally be sure there's enough slack for complete rotation. Any stall will work to set up an axle. Just make sure the stall is complete. You'll know that your stall is complete if the kite is beginning to sink backwards towards the ground. Remember, you may have to walk or even run forwards to maintain a complete stall. Let the kite float backwards towards the ground until one of the tips just starts to drop. Now you got to remember this position because it's just the perfect place to give the tug for your first successful axle. With the kite in position, give a short sharp tug on the upper wing while throwing your other hand forward for slack. The hand that gives slack is critical. Finally, take a step forward extending both arms to give enough slack to finish the rotation. In heavier winds, you'll have to move forward faster and further. So the trick is, as soon as you hit one wingtip, you have to give the kite lots of slack. You have to move downwind. Depending on the wind strength, you may have to run downwind. Yeah. And what people don't realize is that sometimes, in a moderate breeze, to do a nice, full, complete axle, you may end up 20 or 25 feet downwind of where you started. Here's a look at the entire axle in slow motion without any interruptions. You can see that this axle starts close to horizontal, rotates nice and flat, and completes its rotation to end up horizontal again. If you're having problems, these are the things that most often go wrong. If the kite isn't fully stalled to begin with, you won't get a complete axle because the lines will fetch up too early and it'll interrupt the rotation. It's also really easy to forget to give enough slack with the opposite hand just after you make the initial tug to start the axle. This slack is critical to getting the kite all the way around. Once the axle is initiated, it's easy to choke it up by not moving your body forward enough to maintain slack. We know the kite will not turn flatly if the lines aren't slack once you initiate the movement. So it's any tension whatsoever on the lines, it's not going to be a flat axle. Everything you can do to make the kite move slowly and to put it someplace where you can see really well what the kite's doing. If it's way out of there at the end of your lines, you just can't see well enough. Yeah. You know? If you can get it really up close, 20 feet of line, 30 feet of line really shows you the way the kite rotates. When you go out, Tom, and you do axles, you just kind of, you just breathe on the kite, it looks like. You just sort of exhale and the kite goes around. And it's amazing to see. I love that. 
takes very little movement once you know where to put the pressure to make it do a really nice flat. Especially in low wind, you barely have to move your arms at all. You can hold down at your side and basically just twitch. The axle landing is a really satisfying move because it lets you slam the kite down from a flying position almost anywhere in the window, even in big wind. You'll need to get a sliding stall that lets the leading wing drop. Once the wing begins to drop, watch the kite until it's in a vertical position. Let it continue to drop until the bottom wingtip is one wingspan off the ground. Then start the axle to the ground by giving a tug on the top wing. If the height and timing are correct, the kite paced itself down even in high wind. Let's take a look at it in continuous motion. And now once at full speed. The coin toss is an axle maneuver initiated from the ground. Starting from a tip stand, you can tug the high wing to axle the kite off the ground. You can also tug the low wing for a reverse coin toss, or you can start with both tips on the ground. To do coin tosses consistently, you'll need to first work on controlling a tip stand. Find a place with smooth ground wind and practice balancing your kite in all different positions. You need to be able to consistently roll the kite beyond vertical and recover. When you're feeling good about your tip stance, pull your tip up off the ground and transfer support of the kite to the lower line. At this point, your top line should have a little slack in it, ready for the tug. Give a sharp but gentle tug on the top wing while you give slack with the lower hand. You can let the rotation continue and land the kite on the other tip, or you can launch the kite right out of the coin toss. If you're having trouble, chances are you're pulling on the kite too hard. Use a smaller wrist motion, and be sure to give plenty of slack with the other hand. Once you've got this basic coin toss down, try tugging the lower wing for a reverse coin toss that rotates the opposite direction. You can also try starting with both tips on the ground. These variations require a lot of sensitivity in the hand motions and plenty of slack line. If you're going to try the axle off the ground, you can reduce the risk of damage to your kite by being sure that the wing tip that you're going to tug isn't caught on anything. The half axle is a great way to reverse direction at the end of a ground pass. As you fly horizontally, start the half axle by giving a slight pull on the lower control line, followed immediately by a harder pull on the top wing. Step forward as the kite completes the half rotation, then fly out horizontally in the other direction. An interesting extension of the half axle is the cascade. The cascade is simply a series of half axles done back to back from the very top of the window. Start at the top of the window and turn the kite into a vertical position and pull a half axle. Follow immediately with another half axle in the other direction. Alternate left and right half axles as many times as you can before the kite reaches the ground. Now this is one axle maneuver where it actually helps not to give too much slack with the opposite hand. The hand that isn't giving the tug helps to choke the axle halfway through and prevent it from rotating too far. Once you get your axles really smooth and flat and you practice them in almost any wind, it's time to start trying for more than one full rotation. To have success, you'll need two new tools in your toolbox. The first is to learn to use the line opposite the hand that initiates the axle to tend the axle as it rotates. Let's take a look. Here's the initial pull. 
At this point in the rotation, add a little tension to the opposite line to add momentum to the rotation. Here's the same point the second time around. Add tension again to finish the double axle. The second new tool you'll need is to know how and when to give slack to avoid snagging the tips as the kite rotates. Here's the initial pull, and the kite begins to rotate. And right here, give slack to clear the tip as it comes around. And here again, give slack to clear the other tip. One more time to clear the final tip as the kite comes around. This is all part of learning how to fly your line set, which is a key skill for slack line maneuvers of any kind. Once you learn how to fly your line set, you can initiate an axle high in the window and get as many as four or five complete rotations as the kite floats down. What's the, what's the problem with the axle, John? The axle be, can become quite a disease. It's just, <laughs> that's that, all you want, once you first learn how to do an axle, that's all you want to do. <laughs>
For the third exercise, you'll use three sweeps to get to the very top of the window and then glide back down. Notice that anytime you fly higher in the window in light wind, your sweeping motions will have to change angle to keep tension on the line. Here's the first sweep. You can see that its direction is horizontal, the same as the lines. Here's the second sweep. For this one, you'll want to start adding some downward motion. And here's the last one. As you can see, the sweep is almost straight down and ends in a low crouch position. As you turn down into the glide, be sure to touch your wrists together and keep them locked together during the whole glide. With your hands together, you won't have to worry about steering the kite so you can concentrate on the angle of the glide. As you move forward, fine-tune the glide angle by pulling your locked wrists in to make the glide steeper, or extend your hands to flatten the glide out. As you start to feel smooth with this last exercise, try putting a marker on the ground at your starting point. Fly to the top of the window, and as you glide down, concentrate on getting back to your marker before the kite touches down. The 360 is a maneuver for the lightest winds that lets you fly completely outside the wind window in a full circle around you. It's also a great way to get back downwind if you're running out of flying space in light conditions. Start by flying a horizontal ground pass with your arms fully extended. As you near the edge of the window, start walking or running backwards, away from the kite, to keep the kite flying forwards. Keep your hands extended as the kite leaves the window so that if you need some extra power, you can sweep the lines back to keep the kite moving. As the kite re-enters the window at its other edge, you'll be able to slow down again. And if you're not satisfied with just one 360, you can always add another one. In truly no wind conditions with a good ultralight kite, you can fly the kite up over your head and just keep on going, gliding down the other side. Using the techniques from the basic light wind exercises, do several smooth pumps upwards. As the kite nears the top, make one last downward sweep while rotating your body to propel the kite over your head and start it gliding down the other side. Maintain this crouch position until the kite begins a downwind glide then lock your wrists together to glide down the other side. I view sometimes it's like the light wind flying, zero wind flying is more like accompanying the kite. It's, it's going to do beautiful, wonderful things if I'm willing to just go out and follow it along. It's when I get into trouble is when I determine that I'm going to tell it what to do. That's when you break sticks. <laughs> From a power dive straight at the ground, there aren't many moves more elegant than the flare turn landing. This landing sets up the kite ready to relaunch directly from a dive, and even more important, it's the perfect preparation for a 540. Now that's a move that every advanced flyer wants to have down. In light wind, fly straight down the center of the window from the very top. Prepare to give slack by drawing your hands alongside and behind you as the kite dives. Just a few feet above the ground, throw as much slack into the lines as possible by taking a lunging step forward and throwing your arms out in front of you. At the end of this flare motion, keep one hand slightly back so that the slack control line on one side fetches up tight before the other side does. At this point, you can see the slack in the line. Just a fraction of a second later, the line going tight serves as a tug on that wing to rotate the kite 180 degrees in a flat spin then step forward and settle the kite onto both wingtips ready to launch. Let's look at the whole flare turn landing without any interruptions. Here's the dive, the flare, the tug, the rotation, and the landing. And once more at full speed. A cool variation on the flare turn is to flare and rotate to one tip only. Also work on getting your flare as low as possible. You'll be surprised at how low to the ground the kite will spin if it's flat enough. The 540 is an impressive maneuver that you should be able to learn fairly quickly once your flare turn landing is solid and predictable. 
Setup for the 540 is just the same as for the flare turn, except with an entire 360 degrees more rotation, every step becomes critical. Here's the flare portion of the 540. Now Mark needs all the slack he can get to get flat for a 540, so you can see that he really gets his hands and arms back. The flare requires a real lunge forward. Here at the end of that lunge, you can see one hand back and ready for the tug. Just letting the line go tight won't be enough for the 540. Give the line a sharp snap back just at the moment it would go tight, like this. Now maintain slack as the kite rotates a full 540 degrees. Let's look at it with all the pieces put together. You can pull a 540 any time the kite is pointed downwards and in flight, so a great variation is the belly spin out of a downwards turn. Backflips <laughs> are the next frontier. I spend probably a third of my time at the field with the kite upside down on its back, floating around in the sky these days because there's so many cool things you can do with it. And uh, I just get so much joy out of teaching that facet to flying. Unfortunately, there aren't many kites that can do it. There are some kites now that are starting to be able to backflip, but among those, there aren't many kites that are balanced enough to float around, do lazy Susans and various combination maneuvers off their, off their backs. Recoveries from backflips are very difficult to get off of a lot of kites. That's, that's why the Eclipse is the only kite in my bag these days. It, it does everything. Start from a climb at the center of the window. As you near the top of the window, give the kite a final pump downwards, bringing hands down alongside your knees with wrists cocked and ready. Make a sharp tug using a quick wrist motion. Then throw the lines upwards using your arms and your body. This will get you a backflip every time. A simple pull flips the kite back into flying position again. It's amazingly easy to do a basic backflip, and it's so satisfying as well. The kite just lays on its back, and it sits there in size, and then it pops out and starts flying again. It's as dramatic as a snap stall, you know, the same action, stopping flying, being in a completely different position, and then taking off again. To get a balanced backflip, you'll need to release just the right amount for the conditions. Too little release and the backflip won't hold. Too much release can result in the kite over-rotating. Once you can get a balanced backflip, work on maintaining it for as long as possible. Control tension on the lines with your forward walking speed and by making adjustments with your arms. Watch the slack in your lines as you work to balance the backflip. In practicing, your goal should be to get a backflip that starts out at the very top of the window and pulls out just above the ground. Backflips are all about line tension. Backflip is a slack line maneuver. It's all about maintaining just the right amount of slack in your lines. If you pull too hard, it pops out. If you give it too much slack, it'll roll over and start rolling itself up like a yo-yo. Sometimes you can get out of that and it's really cool. Sometimes you can't. It's a little a little inconsistent for me. I quote something that kites aren't supposed to do. I've never seen a kite do that. And it's shocking for people who see it for the first time and have never seen something like that. It's just so, so radical and outrageous. If you're flying a kite that can't do it, it's incredibly frustrating. You just put it down, you get bored. The backflip is one of the biggest reasons that I wanted to fly prism kites because it added that dimension to flying that was not possible with any other kite. And again, for a repertoire of a competition flight for ballet, it became something I knew could add drama to a routine. Well, la Lazy Susans are, are cool. There's, there's a way that you can keep the kite on its back, give the line a little tweak, and make it rotate around like a flying saucer. And if you get the balance right and you start to figure out how it works, then uh, you can even get it done two times, three times. My record is seven with the Eclipse so far. I've done eight with the Spark. Prep for a lazy season by setting up just the same way you would for a backflip. Begin the backflip motion, but this time exaggerate both the tug and the release on one side only. This will set up a slightly uneven backflip that's ready to rotate into a lazy season. A gentle tug on one wing starts the rotation.
keep slack lines as the kite rotates on its back. A sweep with both arms snaps you back out. The same skills that let you float a simple backflip all the way to the ground will also help keep the kite balanced for multiple Lazy Susans. To do multiple Lazy Susans, you'll have to keep careful track of the rotations. Each time the kite comes around to the regular backflip position, give it another tweak on the wing you started with to create another rotation. Here's the backflip, the tug to pull it around, another tug to pull it around the second time, and then a sweep of the arms to bring it back out. It was the first time that one had been seen, and we popped it on its back, and it spun around, and he's in the middle of this crowd saying, and what was that? Once you learn the Lazy Susan well, there's a great combination move that takes advantage of the ability of the Eclipse to backflip out of a downwards turn. Here's the downwards turn into a backflip, into a side sliding Lazy Susan, and back out again. Let's take a look at this move at full speed. Each new maneuver you learn is something that goes into your toolkit. Mm -hmm. And as your toolkit gets larger and larger and you start stacking things on top of each other, then you know new music comes out, new stuff just happens. You know? And uh, that's, that's been a lot of fun for me.